Лаборатория иммунологии и гемопоэза много лет занимается исследованием проблемы заболеваний крови. И мы очень горды тем, что на, на, к нашим конференциям несколько лет назад присоединился непререкаемый авторитет в области лечения опухолей крови. Это Роберт Гейл. Мы очень ценим его мнение и безмерно счастливы, что сегодня он выступит здесь, на этой конференции, с приветственным словом и дальше представит свой э, доклад, который я... Э, э, Сейчас озвучу. Это у нас может ли таргетная иммунотерапия вылечить острый миелоидный лейкоз? Тема очень насущная. Дорогие друзья, приветствуем Роберта Гейла. Здравствуйте. Добрый день. Очень рад вас видеть. I'm very sorry I'm not in uh, Suzdal, lovely Suzdal. I've been there before. It's a beautiful city with its Kremlin and its cathedral. Um, I want to thank Professor Tupitsen for the invitation. Um, and uh, he's asked me to talk about the therapy of acute myeloid leukemia. So let me share my screen. I'm trying to get to the right PowerPoint. I'm sorry. Oh, show sure. windows maybe. Okay, this might be it. Okay, I, I hope you can see that okay. And I hope you can hear me okay. So um, I think, uh, You know, we have, as you just heard from Professor Rossi, substantial progress in treating cancer with immune therapy. But um, you'll notice that there's a distinct lack of progress in treating acute myeloid leukemia. And so I've titled my uh, talk, Why is it so difficult to develop immune therapy of acute myeloid leukemia? So uh, this, this is from PubMed, and it shows the uh, increasing number of publications using the search terms immune therapy and AML. So there's a lot of interest in this, um, but very little progress. So we have a number of challenges in AML that are unique to AML. And I just list them here. We cannot afford to destroy normal bone marrow function. Um, there is no immune surveillance against AML, despite what you must think. Uh, there is an allogeneic, but no autologous immune response to AML. And we lack usable AML specific target antigens. And I'm just going to uh, illustrate these problems and then um, try to suggest the solution. So there is a, a lot of progress in hematology in immune therapy of hematological cancers. We have therapies for ALL, for CL, for plasma cell myeloma, and for lymphoma. But we don't have any effective immune therapy for AML. Well, why, why is that? So why are almost all successful immune therapies for lymphoid and not for myeloid cancers? And I think that that relates to the very different structure of myelopoiesis versus lymphopoiesis. So here you have our usual scheme. 
of the uh, going from hematopoietic stem cells to a lymphoid progenitor with B and T cells or to a myeloid progenitor with these N cells, including granulocytes and platelets. Now, um, these cancers occur in very different places in this hierarchy. The um, lymphoid cancers occur here. They don't occur in a progenitor cell, typically. They occur in more differentiated cells. Whereas the myeloid cancers occur back here in a myeloid progenitor cell, and sometimes even in a hematopoietic stem cell. So this is a very, very important difference. Now, these are the daily production rates in a 70 kilogram man. So every day, every single day, you produce 200 billion red cells, 10 billion granulocytes, and 400 billion platelets. Now, if you look down here at B cells and T cells and NK cells, you can see they are 100 to a million times lower production rates. So there's a huge difference in what we produce every day. And there's also a huge difference in lifespan. Uh, granulocytes last for maybe a few hours, maybe as many as 10 days. B and T cells, they, they last for years. So we cannot afford to destroy normal bone marrow function when we're dealing with a myeloid cancer the way we can with a lymphoid cancer. Now, another, um, I would say in my mind, not controversial issue, if there is no immune surveillance against AML, despite what you might think. So if we take people with cancer with immune deficiency and say, what kind of cancers do they get? Well, they get lymphomas. These are typically associated with Epstein-Barr virus. They get sarcomas that are typically associated with the Kaposi virus. They get melanomas, they get kidney cancers. They get cervical cancers that are typically associated with HPV and they get other skin cancers. They don't get AML. People that are immune deficient do not get acute myeloid leukemia. So most of these associations of immune deficiency are with virus caused cancers. You don't see colon cancer or lung cancer or breast cancer on this list. The common cancers are not a subject of immune surveillance. So this is a study that Gerhard Opeltz in Heidelberg and I did. We looked at 144,000 recipients of kidney transplants. And they have this increase in melanomas, a striking increase in melanoma, but they don't have any increase in AML or if there's any increase is very, very small. So immune surveillance does not operate in AML. Now that's the conclusion number two. Um, now there is an allogeneic, but no autologous immunity response to AML. And I'll show you that here. So, you know, we have graft versus host disease, and then we have graft versus leukemia. By graft versus leukemia, I mean something that is very specific to the leukemia cells, distinct from graft versus host disease. So we could envision these as being the same or perhaps slightly different or perhaps more different or perhaps completely different. Um, so, if we look at the impact of graft versus host disease on the risk of relapse. So 
This panel shows you chronic myeloid leukemia. And this is acute graft versus host disease of increasing severity. And this is chronic graft versus host disease of increasing severity. And we're looking at the decrease in relapse risk. So you can see that as acute graft versus host disease increases, the risk of relapse in CML decreases. And as, as the extent of chronic graft versus host increases, again, the risk of relapse um, decreases in CML. Now let's look at AML, ALL over here. You see the same thing, more graft versus host disease, less relapse. But let's look at AML. You see the story in AML is very, very different. Uh, acute graft versus host disease doesn't have any effect on the relapse risk in AL, AML. And there is some effect of chronic graft versus host disease, but we certainly don't want to produce chronic graft versus host disease in our patients with AML. So the conclusion number three is there is only a weak allogeneic anti-EML effect associated with graft versus host disease compared with ALL and CML, which are very different. Um, and this graft versus host disease, graft versus leukemia effect in AML cannot be convincingly separated from graft versus host disease. That is, if you want to take advantage of this allogeneic effect, you would have to accept graft versus host disease, which is not something that we want. Now, the last challenge is that we lack AML-specific target antigens. So it's important to, to understand the distinction when we use immune therapy between a linkage mark, a lineage marker and a cancer marker. These are completely different. So when we look at lineage markers, you know, all the immune therapies in hematology that you know are lineage markers, CD19, CD20, CD3, BCMA, et cetera. These are the ones in lymphoid cancers and in pink are the ones in myeloid cancers. But these are lineage specific. They are not specific to the, to the cancer cell. And in AML, when it comes to cancer markers or for lymphomas for that matter, we are not dealing with cancer markers. We are dealing with lineage markers. Now, what is the likelihood of having a leukemia specific target antigen for immune therapy of AML? Well, this slide, which looks very busy, but is actually quite simple. So on this axis, on the Y axis, we have the number of mutations per megabase of DNA. And this is a logarithmic scale. So here you have lung cancer, for example, uh, and here you have kidney cancer. But if you look down here is where we have AML, the number of mutations per megabase of DNA in AML is a hundred times or 50 times less than the solid cancers. We have very, very few mutations in AML. Now, why is this important? Well, for example, if you look at checkpoint inhibitor therapy, this y-axis is the objective response rate. And the x-axis is the number of coding mutations 
per megabase of DNA. And you see this very nice correlation. This is mismatch repair colorectal cancer. Has a very high response rate to checkpoint inhibitors. And as the number of mutations per megabase of DNA decreases, you can see pancreas cancer is not responsive to uh, checkpoint inhibitors. So there's a very clear correlation between response to checkpoint inhibitors and mutations per megabase of DNA. And here's AML. It doesn't respond to checkpoint inhibitors. And that's probably because there are very, very few mutations per megabase of DNA. You can have one mutation that causes the disease. So AML is unlikely to elicit immune response because of the low mutation frequency with few neoantigens. Now, what antigens could we potentially target in AML? Well, we have some lineage restricted targets like CD33 or CD34 or CD123. But I, I told you the problem, we, we cannot afford to destroy normal cells. Then we have a few leukemia associated, but not specific antigens like WT1, a Wilms tumor one or PRAIM. Uh, and then we have a couple of leukemia specific mutations like MPN1 mutated or CLIP3 ITD. Now, this is the mutation topography of AML. So these are patients, a large number of patients with intermediate risk AML. So you can see that FLT3 ITD, well, it's there, but it's a small fraction of total patients. Here's NPM1, that's a small fraction. A lot of patients have no detectable mutation. Now other mutations like DMT3A or MPN1, well, these occur in normal people of the same age as people getting AML. So they would not be reasonable targets. We have no way to target MPN1. And so, you know, I just highlighted the either no mutations or mutations that occur in normal people of the age of 50 or 60. So they are not going to be good targets for AML immune therapy. So the conclusion of this part is there is no frequent AML specific target antigen we don't have a way yet to target MPN1 or FLT3, which could be potential targets. And there are often, there are commutations in genes that are found in normal people of the age of AML. Now, as an immunologist, when I think about immune therapy, I think about these five things. I think about antigenicity. Is there an antigen I can go after? But that's different than immunogenicity. Not every antigen provokes an immune response. And then we need accessibility. The cancer cells that we want to kill have to be accessible to the immune system. It's it's easy to kill a cell that's in the blood. It's hard to kill a cell that's in the brain. Now, another concept is the susceptibility to killing. Um, you know, myeloid cells and lymphoid cells are relatively easy to kill. I mean, they are um, very susceptible to damage, whereas a brain cell or a, a, a muscle cell 
is much harder to kill. And then there is this concept that we have been discussing of collateral damage. We can't afford to damage the normal bone marrow. So if we take an AML immune therapy scorecard, on the favorable side is accessibility. We can get to the cells in the blood and bone marrow. And the cells are relatively uh, susceptible to killing. But on the unfavorable side, we have this lack of an antigen, a target antigen. We have a low mutation frequency. We have low immunogenicity as evident the lack of immune surveillance. And then we have this huge limitation of not being able to destroy normal bone marrow cells. Okay, so what's going on in the field? Well, uh, I did a search about two or three weeks ago on, pub, on clinicaltrials.gov using uh, immune therapy and acute myeloid leukemia. And there are 802 trials going on. So huge numbers of trials. Um, now, what are the targets of these trials? Well, I made a whole list of them. I'm not going to read this list. The, the ones on the top in yellow are either lineage, they're mostly lineage associated, but they're not leukemia specific. You have a bunch of ones in red on the bottom. Um, these uh, are on leukemia cells, but they're also on normal bone marrow cells. So these are the targets of the trials, but I would say that none currently is really um, exciting to me. Now, if I look at those 803 immune therapies, you know, I can divide them into antibodies therapies and cell therapies. And the antibody therapies, well, we've got one antibody therapy that is gemtuzumab or ozogamacin um, or mylotarg. You know, this is a CD33 antibody that is linked to colichiomycin, so uh, an antibody drug conjugate. And there is a randomized trial in newly diagnosed adult AML that compared cytirabine and donorubricin, our standard treatment, with cytirabine and donorubricin adding gemtuzumab. And this is the survival probability. So you see there is a very clear advantage we're using gemtuzumab. The problem is that nobody really uses gemtuzumab. I'm not aware of anyone who uses gemtuzumab to treat AML. Now there's a bunch of other approaches in development. And again, I'm not going to read this list, but we have some monoclonal antibodies like CD47, we have some bispecific antibodies like CD3 linked to CD33. We've got a few leukemia associated uh, antigens like CD123. And then people continue to try checkpoint inhibitors, which so far have been unsuccessful. And then we could turn briefly to cell therapy. And there we have uh, PAR T cells uh, to CD123 or CLL1. We have several studies of NK cells, and then we have a few studies of CAR NK cells. The point is that none of these yet 
has been shown to be safe or effective. And none of the, except for gemtuzumab, no immune therapy has been approved in acute myeloid leukemia. And then of course, there's always the possibility of vaccines. And there is in fact, a few vaccines that are in development, but again, none of these have uh, been approved. And I just call your attention to an article in Blood Reviews where my colleagues and I go through this in, in much greater detail, if you're interested. Now, let me just come to the end and say, can we solve these challenges? And I think one approach might be synthetic biology. So here is that scheme again, and here is uh, CD33 on myeloid progenitor cells and also on AML cells. So here are some AML cells that have been stained with CD anti-CD33 antibody. You can see they, they light up very nicely. So CD33 could be a target, but of course we would kill all of the normal bone marrow cells. So that's, that's not okay, that's not acceptable. So what about CRISPR? Could we use CRISPR to help in this situation? Well, um, imagine that you have a CD33 guide RNA, and now you, um, you also have Cas9, and now you take the target DNA and you use CRISPR to delete CD33. So now we have a hematopoietic cell that doesn't have CD33, a normal hematopoietic cell that doesn't have CD33. Now I just call your attention to another article in Cell. I'll just summarize these data. So if you take <coughs> CD33 depleted mouse or human myeloid progenitor cells. They, they function perfectly normally. The cell doesn't need CD33. You can grow them in um, colony forming assays, but you can also restore bone marrow function in immune deficient mice and monkeys. So you have a myeloid, a normal myeloid cell which doesn't have CD33 on its surface, but which can restore normal bone marrow function. Okay, what, what are we gonna do with this? Okay, so here's the experiment. You have human hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. They are CD33 positive. Now, here are some other cells, human uh, hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, where you have knocked out CD33 with CRISPR. Okay, so we have these two sources, potential sources of stem cells. And now we've got some AML cells. These are human AML cells. They are, as I showed you, CD33 positive. Okay, so let's put them into immune deficient mice. So here is an immune deficient mouse with um, his own bone marrow cells and with human leukemia cells, both of these mice. Now we, we make a CAR T cell to CD33. And what happens? Well, this mouse that got the human hematopoietic stem cells um, and has mouse stem cells. Well, this mouse dies. I mean, he doesn't have leukemia, but he doesn't have any normal bone marrow function because the CAR cells have killed the mouse and the human <coughs> bone marrow cells. 
Now this mouse that got the CD33 knockout stem cells, well, this mouse lives because the human cells don't have CD33, they've been knocked out. But the leukemia cells, which are CD33 positive, are gone. Okay, so you, I'll just say that you can do this not only in an immune deficient mouse, but you can do this in a monkey. So how would we try to do this in a human being? Well, we would have a donor, let's say an HLA identical sibling, and we would leukopherese them or do a bone marrow, and we would collect bone marrow cells, which are CD33 positive, and we would collect T cells, which are CD33 negative. Now, we would um, use CRISPR to knock out CD33 on the bone marrow cells. And we would use the T cells to make anti-CD33 CAR T cells. Okay, so here's the person with leukemia. And the first thing we do is we give the CAR anti-CD33 CAR T cells. And we hope that that's going to get, out, get rid of all the AML cells. It will also get rid of all the normal bone marrow cells. And now we can rescue that person with the knocked out, CD33 knockout stem cells from the donor. So that's how this could be theoretically done. Now, no one has tried this. And it's a very, very complicated and dangerous experiment. But I'm just giving you an example of how such a technology could work. So can immune therapy cure AML? That's the question I was asked to address. Well, I think I'm the wrong person to answer this. You need to ask a Russian fortune teller. The Russian fortune teller is more likely to know the answer than I am. So can immune therapy cure AML? I would say hopefully, but we have a long and difficult journey to achieve that goal. So I'd like to end with a quote from Enrico Fermi, the nuclear physicist. Um, he said, before I came here, I was confused about this subject. Having listened, whoops, Having listened to your lecture, I am still confused, but hopefully on a higher level. So, bom spasiba, boshoi spasiba. And uh, I'm again very sorry that I'm not in Suzd lovely Suzdal, but maybe when things quiet down, uh, I'll be able to visit my close colleagues and Professor Tupitsin in uh, Russia again. Спасибо. Уважаемый профессор Гейл, огромное спасибо вам за чрезвычайно проблемный, интереснейший доклад. И, конечно, у наших трансплантологов, наверное, не могло не родиться вопросов. Может быть, в зале есть вопросы? Да, вот Игорь Станиславович Долгополов один из uh, специалистов детской трансплантации. Пожалуйста, Игорь Станиславович. Twenty uh, years ago, we strongly believed that the GVHD disease, uh, the AML, is more susceptible to it. And now we reversed our opinion, and we believe it is less susceptible. Why this change has happened? Well, I, I think that. Um, well, thank you for your question. Um, I mean, the issue is, can we separate graft versus host disease from some leukemia specific effect? Because, you know, we, we don't want graft versus host disease. Now, you know, I've been working on this problem for 50 years. 
And in mice, in mice, it's very easy to separate GVHD from GVL. But most of our mouse leukemias are virus caused or chemical caused. So they have an obvious target antigen. But when we try to do this in humans, you know, it's either been very difficult or impossible. And the other thing is that, as I showed you, we need to make a distinction between the types of leukemia. I mean, CML is very susceptible to this anti-leukemia effect of graft versus host disease. Unfortunately, I would say we don't need this because we have tyrosine kinase inhibitors. You know, we don't need this, an immune effect in CML. We, we don't really need anything in ALL because we have good drugs and we have immune therapy. But this um, leukemia effect is very, very weak, as I showed you in AML. Now, the only encouraging thing that I have seen, and we've published on this, is if you do a bone marrow transplant and you give post-transplant cyclophosphamide to prevent graft-versus-host disease, then you can um, get rid of or reduce graft-versus-host disease but you don't seem to get an increase in leukemia relapse. The thing is that for most people with AML, we're not doing bone marrow transplants. You know, we, we need immune therapies that we can use in conventionally treated people with AML. So, I mean, that's a long answer to your question, but I think we were naive to think that we could use graft versus host disease to get rid of AML. Спасибо огромное, профессор Гейл. Мы вам очень благодарны и надеемся на продолжение коллаборации с вами. Друзья, мы теперь, вроде больше нет у нас вопросов. Спасибо вам большое. Мы безумно благодарны и счастливы вашему участию. Мы должны двигаться дальше уже по программе. Ну... Когда была авария на Чернобыльской атомной станции, Роберт приезжал к нам в онкоцентр. Он приехал, потому что Сорос снабдил два самолета с медикаментами и так далее, чтобы помочь хотя бы тем пожарникам, которые облучились, когда поливали вот эту станцию, бегали там по этим, не понимая, чем это все закончится. Конечно, большинство из них погибло. Они похоронены у нас на Митинском кладбище. И я хочу сказать, что вот он приехал и предложил трансплантацию костного мозга проводить им. А там были дозы более тысячи рентген. Ну, представляете, какие-то, да, это смертельная доза. И первые 10 пожарников погибли. Мы не знали тогда. Это я уже услышал из лекции Гусевой Ангелины. Она член-корреспондент была. Она три крупные аварии прошла. Она уже не молодая была, профессор. Она приехала к нам в Онкоцент через много лет и читала лекцию нам. Потому что, когда он приехал, он приехал с лекции потом к нам, но он читал по трансплантации костного мозга, никак не связано с пожарниками. А Ангелина приехала, читала уже, что там было. И она вышла с предложением запретить дальше трансплантацию. И кому не, делали, не сделали трансплантацию, они выжили. Ну так вот было. И Магате записала свои документы, что те, кто получил дозу, там, по-моему, тысячу рентген, им проводить... Трансплантацию костного мозга нельзя. Ну, то есть это был тоже какой-то этап.